Good evening. My name is Tracy Matz. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute. The John Adams is an emphatically independent cultural foundation that brings mm -hmm. the best and the brightest of American <clears throat> thinking to the Netherlands. Welcome to this online event in collaboration with the Bali as part of their uh, festival called the Night of Dictatorship. What a name for a festival, Tim. Yes, it works, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we were very much hoping that this event this evening with our honored guest from Washington, D.C., David Frum, would be live, that he would be here in person. But as I'm sure you can all imagine, unfortunately, this plan was nixed by Corona. And so we're very happy that he's with us, nevertheless, from his home in Washington, D.C. Our moderator this evening is Tim Wagemakers, who is a programmer here at the Bali. And my role this evening will be to field your questions and to pass them on to our moderator, Tim, and our speaker, David Frum. You can send your questions in via the Slido site. You'll see the URL appearing regularly uh, on your mm -hmm. screen. So feel free to send in your questions. Don't wait. I can see them as they come in, and we'll uh, try to pass on as many of them as we can to our speakers. David from, uh, wrote a book in 2018 called Trumpocracy. And he has recently published the sequel with uh, at, uh, at least as uh, uh, illuminating title, Trumpocalypse, Restoring American Democracy. Uh, there was a, an interesting, it was said that the, the first one was about the prediction and that this one now is about the assessment of the, f this first, perhaps first of two, who knows, um, presidency of Donald Trump. And I, I read a quote about it that I thought was very, uh, uh, that really stuck with me and that I wanted to <laughs> share with you as sort of basis of this evening. Democracy is tested by its ability to deliver security, prosperity, and justice. And I think that gives us a set of important criteria by which to judge the past years of this administration. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to our moderator, Tim, and I will be back at the end of our session with some closing remarks. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks so much. A warm welcome, everyone. Nice that you're viewing this conversation with David Frum. As Tracy already said, he's the author of this amazing book, Trumpocalypse, uh, which I, um, David, I'm just going to say directly to you, really enjoyed reading. It's a really concise, good account of, I think, what's going on in America, but also the underlying trends and tendencies that have been shaping the forces that are now in play. Um, just to introduce him a bit further, he's a senior editor at The Atlantic. Um, he knows his way around DC, not only because he's uh, Zooming with us right from DC right now, but also because he worked, uh, for example, as special assistant and speechwriter to President George W. Bush. Um, very warm welcome, David. Thanks for talking to us. Um, I'd like to talk with you tonight about the presidential elections, of course, but also about how we got here, the future of the Rep Republican Party. Um, but maybe we should start with some recent developments. And we have a small clip about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who passed away, and Donald Trump is in quite a rush to appoint a new Supreme Court judge. Um, let's look at the small clip, and then we can talk away from there. L let's watch it. As we see the clip. The clock is ticking. Yeah, I know it's moving along, but we have a lot of time. We have nothing but time, especially since we have the support. You know, we have senatorial support. Uh, people have come out, and I guess we have all the votes we're going to need. They're going to be very happy with the candidate. They know most of the candidates anyway. I think they know maybe all of the candidates. And uh, we have great support, great support from the people also. Have you made a decision and you're just going to reveal it on Saturday? Or I would say that I'm very close to making a decision in my own mind, and I'm going to reveal it on Saturday. And I'm doing that out of respect for Justice Ginsburg. Uh, you. Yeah, it's a really short clip. And your book is about restoring American democracy. And you say it's also about acting now to protect the country and restore it. Is this with the Supreme Court uh, appointment uh, going on the way, such a defining moment right now we are in? 
a, a, a real alarm about what could be. Um, it is very possible that many important decisions about this uh, very complicated election will end up at the Supreme Court. And President Trump wants to make sure that he has a favorable ma ma uh, majority working on his behalf at the Supreme Court. Um, so he is determined to cram through an appointment before the election. It's going to raise some important legitimacy concerns yeah. because I, I think it's um, it's evident that if every legal citizen, if every legal vote were allowed to be cast in the United States, and if all of those votes were properly counted, um, that Donald Trump would lose the coming election. And again, in a, this hypothetical condition of, of fairness, um, this, the Republican Senate would also probably lose. And so people who are on uh, pretty obviously on their way out of power under fair conditions are going to choose a decision maker who may allow them to keep power in yeah. an unfair way. That's, I, I think, going to be disturbing to a lot of people. Yeah. And, and in that sense, it's... Um I mean, it's it's a, I, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was quite old, but it's um, a really um, bad moment in that sense. That really sh uh, is a new force and shapes up a new dynamic in this election right now. Yes. Um, so, so this is, has been one of um, the the major themes of the two books, Trumpocracy and Trumpocalypse, which is um, Donald Trump uh, is an accelerant of existing problems in American life. I mean, it was true even without Donald Trump that the American system of government was working less well in the 21st century yeah. than it had worked in the 20th century. Um, but Donald Trump is both a product of that deterioration of, of American democracy and an accelerant pushing it to do worse things because um, he lacks any sense of shame. He lacks any feeling of consistency. And because he is so nakedly about his own um, because he's so naked about it. So he is, he's pushed the system in, in new kinds of ways. Um, a, a way to think about this is, you know, in the United States, as in e almost every democratic country, it is possible for the government to be elected with fewer votes than the opposition. Yeah. In a, in a system like the Netherlands, it must happen all the time, that parties, you're a multi-party proportional representation mm. system, and no one finds it shocking that parties two and three might group together and form a coalition to exclude party yeah, one. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure that yeah. happens often. In a Westminster system, like Great Britain or Canada or Australia, again, in the last election in Canada in 2019, Justin Trudeau got fewer votes than his principal opponent, the leader of the Conservative Party. Um, and But he held the government anyway. But the, in, in a parliamentary system, this is not so much of a problem because the leader of the government is just that. I, I, I know I grew up in Canada. I spent time there. Um, it would be strange if a Canadian prime minister were to speak about the Canadian people. Yeah. The Canadian prime minister is the leader of the government. There's also an opposition. And the leader of the, of the opposition also represents the state just as much as the prime minister does. And I, I assume it's the same way uh, yeah, in sure. the Netherlands. Yeah. Donald Trump claims to speak on behalf of the whole people and in a way that is more aggressive than most presidents do, even though he has been rejected by more people than supported him. Um, and so he has pushed, and this is the thing I really want to impress from on a foreign point, the reason we are in such crisis um, is he is pushing his party and his supporters um, to an explicit repudiation of the idea of majority rule, to an explicit mm -hmm. repudiation of the idea that um, the, whoever gets the most votes should form the government. Yeah. That we are now talking about, about in new kinds of ways that we really did not talk before Donald Trump. Be, 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 because actually, I said in my intro, you've worked for George W. Bush. He, he was one of the other presidents who did not win the popular vote, but still was installed right. president. But actually, what you're saying is, if a president after that, working within that system, tries to unify and be a president for everyone, then you can say the system might not work as well as we want, but there's not a real problem. But if you're shameless about it and saying you represent the American people, then that is eroding the institution. Well, I, I remember that election very well. And George Bush experienced it as a huge problem of legitimacy that he failed to win um, the popular vote. Um, again, it was always theoretically possible, but in every election from the late 19th century until 2000, by coincidence, it had happened that the president who won the Electoral College also won the popular vote. When that didn't happen for George Bush, um, it was a problem. And I quote, I think, in Trumpocalypse, yeah. the speech President Bush gave 
in December of 2000, where he, he accepted the decision of the Supreme Court, but vowed, I will be a president for everybody. This is not a party event. Um, he spoke about the need to earn the trust of the people who had voted against him. And um, people can have their views about George W. Bush, but he experienced this subjectively as something he had to do something about. And I, I also will say privately that one of the, or personally, um, that I think one of the reasons that 9-11 had the impact on American society that it did, that, that, um, that surge of unity, was the country was looking for a way to come together behind a president that had come into office in a way that no president had mm. done in 115 years. Um, and so 9-11 uh, in a way legitimated his presidency in a way that hadn't been before. But Donald Trump has never tried to do any, any of those things. And so we have, um, and, and his plan for re-election uh, is again to use the defects, the antiquities of the American political system to claim to be president of the people, even as he loses by yeah. three, five, as many, it's quite possible he could lose by 10 million votes. And he's not interested in winning the popular vote. He's interested in winning electoral college and becoming president again. It's impossible for him. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is almost literally impossible for him yeah. to. Hey, here's a way to think about this, just as a sense of where we're going. So in 2016, 133 million votes were cast. Now, if you sort of look at where we were in 2018, and do, the political scientists, I won't go through the logic, but mm. the political scientists say it's very likely that 145 million votes will be attempted to be cast in 2020. If you average all the polls, Donald Trump gets about 42 and a half percent of those 145 million votes, and Joe Biden will get about 50 and a half percent. That you do the arithmetic, that is a disparity, if all of that is correct, mm. of 10 million votes. That is the margin of popular vote defeat that Donald Trump is looking at, and yet he will try to hold on to power all the same. That means you have to reject the democratic idea. It's just, it's just too flagrant otherwise. But at the same time, um, you've described President Trump as a different kind of president. In your book, you call him a wartime president. Um, and actually, maybe to get, to, to get a bit more behind the elections, what is... I mean, people frame this election as the fight for the future of America, right? And you wrote also about this in your book, that, 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 there are, that, it's an, uh, um, that it's an important moment for America to see where we're going. How would you summarize this fight to the core? I mean, we can't go through the entire book, but what's the, what's the essence of this fight that we are in with Trump as wartime president? Well, when I called him a wartime president, I was actually b uh, borrowing a phrase from an Atlantic colleague of mine, Ron Brownstein, who said that Don Donald Trump is a wartime president in a war that rural America is fighting against urban America. Mm. Um, it, it, he's, uh, he's, he's the president of, or as I say, he, this is my phrase, that he is the president of the white population of the red states of America. He has never tried to be president of all of the United States of America. Um, I, I think one of the ways to think about this, especially from the vantage point of Amsterdam, is to say that politics across the developed world has these days a lot more in common than it does differently. Everywhere, um, we are dealing with similar kinds of stresses. We're dealing with um, uh, the um, failure of, of market economies to deliver the results that they delivered yeah. in the 30 and 40 years after World War II. We're dealing with the stresses of globalization, especially mass migration. Uh, we're dealing with the uh, rise of economic competition from China and India. And so we see just about everywhere um, in every democratic system that we, we are seeing the, the decline of an, the old divide between parties of the left and right, social democrats versus, as you would call them, liberal, as we would call them, conservative yeah, yeah, parties, yeah, yeah. in favor of a new politics of identity where um, you have these authoritarian nationalist groupings, and that, and they have much more in common. Each it's all, and I talk in the book about how strange it is to call them nationalist when they're actually so internationalist. That yeah. social democratic parties are now quite different country to country, but uh, you know, in, in, uh, from. Poland to Italy to that Don, uh, Donald Trump is a cultural hero. Uh, the mask is a cultural symbol. Um, you know, for the people on the left hand side, the mask is just a medical device that either yeah, works yeah. or not. And you listen to the experts, and they say, "Here's what the mask can and can do, and here's what it can't do." And it, it's not; it doesn't have moral meaning. It's just an object that does a certain job more or yeah. less well. But, but, but for people on this other side, the mask is a powerful symbol, and it's so similar across country to country.
But so, so if you talk about concepts of identity, if you talk about this cultural hero, then you, you wrote your book, it, it, it starts with, I'm, I'm writing this in March, um, and at the beginning of, 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 of COVID, um, but we've seen some really urgent developments in America. We've seen the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen, well, you actually mentioned it in your previous answer already, the whole thing about the masks, whether or not to wear them. Would you say that this is an extension or another example of what you've been describing in your book? Or has um, you've also gained new insights about this fight that we're talking about? Well, um the, I, I, I keep saying about the Trump presidency that while there are many secrets, there are no mysteries. Mm. That we have, <laughs> we have, the the essential logic of it has always been there, and it's very similar to things you see in France and Germany yeah. and in and in your own country. Um, and what what we're arguing about is whether the, the um, democratic mixed economy consensus that we took out of the ruins of World War II. Um, the sense that we all that we all are in this together, that we that um, we need international institutions to keep the peace. In fact, that keeping the peace is the supreme yeah. goal of political leadership. Um, these maybe it's just the passing of time, but those things seem increasingly unreal. And that you can have in, you can have in Donald Trump a president who rejects NATO, who rejects the post-war trading system, and you see people like that across the continent of Europe. Um, and I, I often feel that this is something where um, the, the divide may be between those who remember hmm. and those who don't, who, who know what we have overcome, what we have accomplished, and those who no longer care. Yeah, but, 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 but at the same time, you could maybe also say, um, or some people say, Trump is the last shrug of a sort of old world. And, and, and millennials vote differently right now. The demography of the country is becoming more diverse every day. The new America is being made already, but it's just not coming from the White House. Well, um, I, there, there was a book published in, I think, about 2002 called The Emerging Democratic Majority. Um, and it gained a lot of influence because I think one of the things that people... One of the last trace elements of Marxism on people on the left is a belief in automatic historical processes. Um, that uh, society develops in a certain way, society develops and politics must follow. And I think when you actually say out loud this idea, I, I just saw you smile. You say, well, that's obviously not true. But the habit of thinking that way yeah, is, yeah. I think, very deep on people on the left-hand side of the spectrum, even if they mark the Marx habit, even if they reject the Marx ideology. And I think in all of our countries, we're going to see we have choices to make. And, and so one of the things I'm asked a lot about um, and, uh, is to make predictions. And I always refuse to do this uh, because... The, the people who make predictions treat the future as a thing that exists, a thing that about which comments can be made. And they they do not see that the future is something we are making together right now. And in fact, events mm. like this, we are we are choosing a future one way or the other. Um, and it could be radically different depending yeah. on what people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're talking, and then I'm sure there are many questions coming in from Slido. Maybe one thing to touch upon is we're, when we're talking about re-election, actually one of the things you say in your book is, even if Trump is not re-elected, still the damage is being done, and his legacy is something. Actually, you're, I quote you, because I think it's uh, better in your words, to contain and reverse the global movement to illiberal authoritarianism, it will be necessary to do more, much more, than eject that movement's mouthpiece president from the Oval Office. Yes. Can you elaborate well, we on are, that? Well, well there's... Uh, we were talking just a moment ago about the, the dynamic nature of politics, mm. how politics is about choices. And so um, if Donald Trump loses, first, the, the, the people who supported him and, and who uh, they, they remain, um, and the weaknesses in the American political system that he exploited, they remain. And uh, the adverse trends in the world economy, they, they all remain. I mean, we are moving to a world in which many people are losing faith in the ideas of, of trade and integration. Um, in, on the European continent, you can see many people losing um, 
becoming impatient with the European yeah, project yeah. and and seeing it as tedious and boring and and uh, not the the poetry is all is all with those who would destroy, not with those who want to build and create. And so we are going to when this if we get through 2020 um, on the two sides of the Atlantic together that the job of, of restoring partnerships, restoring trading arrangements, um, making people understand that democracy is, is exciting and ennobling. And I think one of the, one of the things we saw in, in movements like, what we see in movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and the Bernie Sanders movement is they're kind of impatient with meetings. That they think politics is something that happens in the streets. It happens on your feet. Um, it happens to the accompaniment of music. And the idea that, no, it happens in a committee room. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, it happens by raising your hand and speaking in turn, that that is politics. Uh, when the first book came out, um, and it was, a, a, right now we're in kind of in a cynical and tired mood in the United States. When the first book came out, we were in a much more energized mood. And so I spoke to a lot of very idealistic young people who, who uh, at different campuses who would ask me, what, what could they personally do uh, to make a difference? And I, my advice to them always was, get involved in something political, that seems boring. Go to uh, um, join, get involved with a group that um, decides whether or not um, liquor licenses can go till in your neighborhood can be extended till two in the morning or they must stop at midnight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, serve on a jury. Anything where you must work with people who are different from yourself toward a limited goal and where you develop the habits of political cooperation. And what, what you see in these mass, uh, um, and I think you no, know, I think we all have some sympathy with the ultimate goals of Black Lives Matter. But, but what we see is a movement that increasingly is a movement and not a political activity at all. And um, the energies of movements are for democratic societies to channel them in productive ways is always very difficult and it requires habits that we value less than people did 30 and 40 years yeah, ago. But at the same time, that's also a second step, right? After raising awareness, getting involved, the, 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 the things people are fighting for drip into politics and other people start taking it over. It's also a natural process, maybe. Yes and no. If, if, if you are prepared to accept, I will not get my own way. Hmm. Uh, if you if you say that, that getting a, some of what I want is good, it's unreasonable. that Learning to appreciate compromise. Unless, if I do not get everything, it's yeah, a yeah. betrayal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's why revolutionary movements so often end up at the guillotine, because the, they they know only two expo, two th there are only two possibilities: the total creation of a new society, or betrayal from yeah. within. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And since they never create a new society, there must always be betrayal from within. It's a good moment, maybe, uh, if we're at the guillotine right now, to go to Slido and see what questions are come uh, popping in. Tracy, do you have a few? I have uh, a lot, and uh, thank you all for sending them in. A lot of really good questions. One of them that I think uh, 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 connects well with this part of our discussion, if Biden is elected, what should his first priority be to reinvigorate American democracy? I think his, his first priorities have to be to... Um, deal with the choke points in the American political system that will enable a minority to doom him to failure. Um, because polit politics will continue. Um, and if, if we have a weak recovery from coronavirus, um, if the problems don't get, if there isn't quick improvement, there is an election in 2022, and, um, and, and that isn't enough time for the Republican Party to be reconciled to Democratic values. So Biden needs to do things to make sure that he's able to realize a meaningful program. And some of that will be at the federal level, uh, reforms to Congress. Um, I, I would say um, making sure that there's some urban states like the District of Columbia, getting statehood quickly for the District of Columbia. A lot of them happen at the local level, because one of the ways that 2020 will be very different from 2008. And it will give an opportunity that wasn't there in 2008, is 2020 is also a census year, which means that 2021 will be a, a redistricting year. Mm. What happened to President Obama? So he, he wins in 2008, he becomes president in 2009. He does not deliver results very quickly. And so he loses seats in 2010, and then the Republicans who gain seats and who achieve at the state level a dominance they have not had since the 1920s, then proceed to rewrite all of the maps in a way that gives them, through the 2010s, um, massive 
power at the state level. In, in the 2018 election, Republicans got about 45% of the vote in the state of Wisconsin, and they got about 65% of the seats. And they owe that success to the maps they drew back in 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Democrats are going to have an opportunity, if they win at the state level in 2020, to draw less gerrymandered maps in 2021 and to, and to make, create a more competitive political system. I say this, I'm, I remain a registered Republican, and I look forward to the day I can return to working within my natural political party. But we need, we need the Democrats to be successful in this project because we need Republicans to be forced to confront. Yeah, 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 yeah. They must be a party of the Democratic center right. They must seek power by competing for votes, not seek power by preventing people from voting. Tracy, another question? One of the questions that, uh, uh, if I may uh, uh, steal the mic in this case, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you myself, David, was what does it mean to you now to be a Republican in a time when, the, in the eyes of many, the Republican Party has uh, gone over to the dark side? Well, without being overdramatic about this comparison, um, <laughs> no, I, I think there have been many moments where a political system emerges from authoritarianism. That uh, where, let me, let me answer it with another question. What does it mean to be on the left in Eastern Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall? What does it mean to be on the right in Chile after the departure of Pinochet? That is, that you had these authoritarian leaders who hijacked your values for their own purposes. And you have to find some way to re rehabilitate your values while repudiating authoritarian methods. Mm -hmm. And you, it's just so just as, uh, and it's been, it's challenging. I mean, it has been challenging for the German left to, uh, the, especially the, in, in the eastern part of Germany, to make its peace fully with the German Republic, and it's been challenging for the Chilean right to do the same. I think that's sort of what it means. I mean, I am someone, I am a believer in markets, I'm a believer in private property, I am, I'm sympathetic to the problems of business enterprise. Um, I want to see a, generally a smaller state sector rather than a bigger state sector. Um, I want to see, um, I'm prepared to trade um, I, I, if, give, at any given moment, given the choice between more liberty and more equality, I make the more liberty choice. You know, the things that push you toward the, the, the right, as we call it in the modern world, that's, that's where I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm also a, a small d Democrat, and I'm, a, um, and I'm in that broad sense of the term, I'm, I'm forced to confront, I, I'm someone who believes in the broadest idea of what it means to be a liberal, that is to, to be in favor of the free competition of ideas and the, the horror, the use of force in politics. Yeah. Um, so we have a Republican Party that needs to be redeemed and made a useful institution again, rather than a dangerous one. I, I think that's something we're going to dive into also a bit later. Maybe one more question from Slido. Do you have one? Yes, this uh, uh, connects with what you were just saying, David. Um, one of our uh, audience members asked mm. whether the Republican mm. party, party can be salvaged without denouncing the Trump administration. Well, it's going to have to be salvaged because so long as we have the political institutions we do, the United States will be a two-party system. Um, and it's so hard to launch a new political party in the United States. I mean, we have seen parties go through events that would seem even more discrediting than Donald Trump. I say in the book that the Democrats got themselves on the wrong side of the Civil War. The Republicans got themselves on the wrong side of the Great Depression. Uh, and, and both parties managed to come back. Because it's so yeah. because. That, that you, that it's easier to change them than to start start new. Yeah. Um, I, I think it will ha it won't happen that it, it the process of coming to terms with Donald Trump will happen through generational change. That people who are not mm. present will say, who will get younger people and they will say, well, you know, obviously I wanted nothing to do with that, but I still believe in these principles. And that, that's how reform will, I hope, come. But yeah. I, we need it to happen fast because it's going to be a bumpy ride in the next uh, two to four years post-COVID. And we, if we have a Trump, a party that remains Trumpified, being one of our two great parties in the United States, we will never achieve democratic stability. But that maybe also demands some courage or some, um, um, how do you say it? There is this moment right now, also you see that with the nomination of a new Supreme Court judge, that you can take the risk of walking along a long way with Trump 
hoping he doesn't get re-elected, but you still get a favorable uh, Supreme Court in that sense. So you gamble a bit on getting both if you are a Republican. How do you move away from that gamble? Because it requ requires some long-term planning, some long-term vision about where you want to end up as a Republican Party and what you think is more important, sealing the deal right now or working towards an endurable vision? Well, American parties can't work that way. We don't have a central committee. There's no central brain. There's no leadership. Um, you know, in, in the middle two, th in the first decade of the 21st century, um, the British conservatives had, had lost a lot of elections during the Tony Blair era. And then about six people met <laughs> in the living room of David Cameron and decided we need to rethink what it means to be a conservative. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do it because if six people was enough, yeah, that's yeah. not how it ever works in American. I, I make it up. <laughs> I don't know that it was literally six yeah, people, yeah. but it was a, a handful of people. Um, that's not how it works here. I mean, and it, it will work through. Um, well, there were attempts, right? Trial, I mean, when Mitt Romney. Sorry. I mean, when Mitt Romney lost to Obama, there was a report made. I think it's called the autopsy, or people called it. And it said the GOP should expand its outreach to communities of color, women, young voters. So there were agendas being made. But, but is there still someone pushing that forward? It, no one now. But what will happen is, and this, this is. This is the, how the process of regeneration could happen. If the, if the 2020 election is bad enough for Republicans, not only at the national level, but at the state level, if, they, um, if the gerrymanders of the 2010s are corrected in the 2000s and 20s, um, and Republicans realize a lot of things that they and we care about are mm. in danger unless they find ways to be competitive, uh, that's how change comes, and it will start, I think, more at the state level. The, 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 the thing I worry about is the California example, which is you know, California has not been a competitive two-party state really for 15 years. So you would think that there would be ambitious political entrepreneurs, and California has lots of problems. Uh, so you would say that, that there would be ambitious who would say, uh, you know, there, there are homeless people on the street, and uh, no one will do anything about it. Uh, that the state has these terrible unfunded pension liabilities to its public sector workers. No one will do anything. And some political entrepreneur will say, everybody wants to be the Democratic candidate for governor. Nobody wants to be the Republican candidate for governor. I will choose the weaker party and build a career that way. But that is, strangely enough, has not happened. And the California party has responded to 15 years of failure by becoming ever more extreme and failing ever worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that... that that's the, the trap that you can get into if you're not careful. I think some people want to dive a little bit deeper into something you mentioned, Tracy. We have uh, uh, quite a few questions uh, from people who wonder, um, is the U.S. on the brink of civil war? Will states secede from the Union? And what is the worst case scenario if Trump is reelected or claims the election? Um, I, I share the view that we live in a much more peaceful world than people did even 30 years ago. Um, so I, I, I think I don't envision these kinds of very dramatic, very violent scenarios. But I, I do worry about, and I think we are seeing this, um, the risk of um, l low intensity uh, right-wing racialist violence. And I have a chapter in the book about this. Um, the, the attack on the Christchurch, the Christchurch New Zealand mosque, uh, Ander, uh, Anders Breivik, um, the attacks we've seen in the United States. So this is not a civil war because we're talking about, you know, the, the most terrible of these killers will kill some dozens of people, which is hard. That's hardly, I mean, it's, it's a horrifying catastrophe, but it's not a battle. Um, because we've, we, we don't do that anymore. Uh, but I worry about um, that, just a, that just as disturbed young men from Islamic backgrounds can go on the internet and find a starter kit of rationalizations and methods and slogans and ideology, and, the, the, they, they, and, then, and then the starter kit says, now go find your own weapon and go find your own target. 
There's no training, there's no program, there's no organization, but there is a kind of prefabricated tissue of ideas and grievances yeah. and justifications. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing now in, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, young men from um, traditional you know, ethnic majority backgrounds self-radicalizing in that same ISIS way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and in our country where it's so easy to get weapons, if you, if you can find a rationalization and a grievance, you can find a weapon and then you can find a target. You, but, you wrote about this today. That we'll, we will see a lot of this. Yeah. You mentioned this today on Twitter, uh, David. You're an active yeah. uh, Twitterer and I enjoy reading your tweets. And you said uh, uh, there was uh, a video of a group of armed men walking the streets. Uh, uh, yes. And you said this is not uh, militia. This is simply a gang. Right. So that well, we have seems a to indicate a, a serious lawlessness. Well, we will see men in, in scraps and fragments of military uniform carrying weapons and, and trying to intimidate their neighbors, and they will often be described as part of a militia movement. Um, well, a militia in America is an old established institution in the United States. It is the armed force of a state government. And, the, and what makes something a militia, we have uh, the first federal act describing the militia was passed in 1792. And it, 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 it regulated the relationship between the federal government and the militias. And, and it identified two crucial elements to make something a militia. There must be officers who have control over their troops. And those officers must in turn answer to a political authority. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have those two conditions, the authors, officers dr discipline the troops and the officers answer, then it's a militia. It's, and it's distinguished from the regular armed forces because it's, it's less professional. Yeah. Uh, they're maybe not paid. They maybe don't drill all the time. But these people, they are gangs. And we have, and this is an increasingly common phenomenon in the United States. And many of the individuals in those gangs will, um, again, find their way to uh, prefabricated rationalizations for violence on the but, internet. I, I, once Trump is gone, I do worry about this as a problem. But then maybe that was another segment I thought would be interesting to talk about, and that's maybe, and you write in your book also about it, how did we get here? I mean, and, and one of the things in your book, I thought it was a really striking um, sentence. You write about some conservative presidents, you write, sometimes they have drawn power from deep and dark energies in the American soul. And, and, and you say that in response to some people claiming uh, in the book uh, racism and authoritarianism were always present within American conservatism. Is, is it in that sense that, that, that what's happening right now and what we're seeing is a legacy also of the presidents that came before him and also a president maybe you served? Is there some truth to that? Well. Be, because I thought it was I really a, a deep sentence that they have drawn yeah. from these deep yes, and but, dark but energies. I, but I, I think I go on to say in that same paragraph that while they drew from these energies, they also tried to control hmm. the energies. And the difference between um, a Ronald Reagan or a George W. Bush or um, uh, I'll, I'll tell a story about President Bush. I remember being in a, a conversation with him with a staffer, and one of our staffers, who's a very sophisticated, modern person and, you know, went on to a very successful career, but his father was kind of an oddball who uh, lived in the hills with that. And, and President Bush was very funny. He asked this, this staffer, so, so your dad, does he have his own generator? Yeah, yeah. Does he keep stock up on canned goods? And, like, he just, he completely knew the type, but he obviously thought of it as, like that that's not one of mm. my supporters i have zero time for that um but i would say we have to do two things we have to keep two truths in mind and americans tend to say they explain everything in american society by reference to something else in american society <laughs> so i say we see donald trump and therefore we will look backwards into the american past and look at reagan and george w bush and richard nixon and i'm always trying to press americans to be less parochial in their political thinking I said, okay, yes, I'm, I'm not telling you you're completely wrong that this has historical hmm. continuity, but it is notable that there are similar movements in Poland, in Hungary, in Eastern Germany, in France, in Great Britain. They are not drawing from the history of the Republican Party. So I, I encourage you to look across borders yep. and across, and look at. Um, look laterally at the experiences of many different advanced countries whose politics are so similar to one another and emphasize that more and the, um, the, the uniqueness of the American experience emphasize it less. Because I think with this, 
these authoritarian nationalist movements, we are all very much in the same boat. Yeah. And I think we will, that the solution uh, to these problems is going to, we're all in the same boat too, because it's going to require more international cooperation, both at the basic level of police work. We have to make sure that, you know, the man who shot up the mosque was an Australian born yeah. person who um, did his weapons training in Europe and then decided to carry out his murder in New Zealand because he found the police there less sophisticated than in Australia. And, and that these people are moving across borders, so the police have to move, work yeah, across yeah, yeah, borders. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, if we're going to get our economies moving again post-COVID, we, um, we are going to need more trade and more international organization. I mean, it is, a, it is a horrible thing to me that in this COVID crisis, how li I mean, you've seen even in Europe, a breakdown of cooperation when you had borders rise and France and Germany refused to share medical supplies with Italy, never mind the absence of cooperation between the United States and the European Union and, and the, the British off on their own adventure. Um, and that what we ought to have learned from the past, from this experience, if, if we didn't know it already was, um, we, this world's problems are too big for any one government, yeah. even the government yeah. of the but, United States. But maybe because I think that's a, that's a really excellent analysis of not emphasizing America's uniqueness all the time to explain things that are going on in the entire world. At the same time, we've all seen that America in the past decades was such an important world power, maybe a world leader, that of course they were also in a situation to spread certain, um, uh, how do you say it? Um, what's happening in America also affects other countries. So at the same time, you can also say that, for example, if you talk about free markets, if you talk about trade, for decades that was shaped by American uh, stance towards that. Well, that's going to have to change. I mean, when I was in the Bush administration, as you mentioned, and that was not even now, that's not quite 20 years ago. Depending on who's doing the math, the American economy then was about seven times the size of the Chinese economy. Hmm. When we went into the last global financial crisis in 2008, the American economy was three times the size of the Chinese economy. Uh, today, depending on who's counting, the Chinese economy is about three quarters the size of the United States, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And uh, by the, before I am able to finish probably my last book, uh, the Chinese economy will overtake the United States economy, sometime perhaps as, as soon as, as this coming decade. So we no longer live in a world in which the United States, now the United States will remain the richest country, or, or the America, sorry, will remain richer than China, but the idea that the United States will be able to impose its will on the world, and that, that's one of the ways that Donald Trump is such a backward looking figure, because his big idea has been, he will bark orders and everybody else will obey. Mm -hmm. And he didn't understand, when America could bark orders like that, the presidents were wise enough not to try, uh, and uh, one, maybe one of the reasons we have Donald Trump is because we are realizing we've lost our power to bark orders, and so we got a barker at exactly the moment when the barker became most obsolete. Uh, so, um, but that's like the I emperor without going, any clothes on, right? Yeah, I think it's, it was, or maybe like uh, when you said emperor, maybe like the way that the, as the Roman Empire got weaker, the Roman emperors had ever more elaborate etiquette. Um, you know, when they were all powerful, they were simple people who dressed like anybody else. When, when as their empire deteriorated, they yeah, insisted yeah, yeah, they would yeah, yeah. wear these absurd costumes. Um, so, uh, I just think if we're going to have um, a world of trade and democratic agreement, we are going to have to have partnership and alliances, and we're going to need um, American American leadership is going to have to be self conscious about the need for cooperation yeah, in a yeah, way yeah. that Donald Trump defies. Tracy, are there yes. any other questions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you were addressing the uh, relative strength of the Chinese economy. There have been several questions about the role of Russia in this election. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of our uh, uh, audience members who sent it a question is worried that Biden, if he wins, will retaliate against Russia and that that might start another world war. Can you address the issue of Russia's role in these elections? Um. Russia had, I think, a, an important and maybe even decisive role in 2016. Um, I think in um, 2020, they're likely to be less effective. Um, their most important, the most important thing that they did in 2016 was to uh, contribute to the deterioration in African-American turnout. Uh, 
they, the, the Russians, their, their most sophisticated propaganda message are messages aimed at stoking the disillusionment and alienation of younger black voters, especially younger black men. The system is rigged. It's all hopeless. You should stay home. And so uh, we saw um, black turnout has been rising in every election since the 1960s. Um, Obviously, because of the Obama election, that drove in a, a historic spike in black voter turnout, and it reached this, an all time. It reached what everyone thought was a peak in 2008, and then in 2012, it rose even higher than in 2008. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons that Mitt Romney was surprised by the election, that his model was based on well, 2008. That's a record for black turnout. It can't be any higher than that in 2012. Oh, but it turned out it was. President Obama. Is, de is deteriorating on every other group in the population. You just do the arithmetic. He's not being disrespectful, but you just do the arithmetic. He can't win, except black America turned out in even greater numbers in 2012 than in 2008. In fact, 2012 was the first election in American history where a black person was more likely to come vote than a white person was. So obviously there was going to be some relaxation from that in 2016. But the decline was much bigger than you would it fell not only back, to, it fell back below 2008 levels, and it fell furthest in the Midwest, and it fell in of all, and it fell furthest of the two, the states in which it fell deepest were Wisconsin and Michigan. And if black turnout in those two states had been anything like its historic norm, Hillary Clinton would have won, the, would have won Michigan by a million votes at least. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the Russians were important there. But this point about, look, th this is a piece of, junk from RT and Sputnik. The Russians are always saying, if we don't get our way, if you say we can't use poison gas, that's it, World War III. And you think, you know what? Russia is a society with an economy the size of Italy, uh, with a, militarily, a military less capable than Israel's. Um, you know, if you just tell them the rules, yeah, yeah. they're going to have to listen. Um, and it, and it, it, that it is it's they have uh, there are a lot of policy outcomes other than they get to do whatever they want in World War Three. Yeah, yeah. So next question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there have been also several questions about the U.S. election system. Uh, is it possible to uh, finally make the move away from the electoral college and towards a majority vote? Well, I think. We, we should be doing in the 2020s at the state level some experiments. I mean, there is a project, for example, at some states to experiment with ranked choice voting. I, I would be interested to see how that comes out. Uh, I mean, we do have these laboratories of democracy where we need to try things. And, and one of the advantages of, our, of the federal system is you get to experiment with ideas at the state level, see if they produce positive results, and then uh, if they work. Um, uh, adopt those ideas nationally. It's it's hard to see how you get rid of the electoral college. That would mean changing um, the constitution, right? But there there are ways you can mitigate the electoral college. For example, electoral votes are distributed according to the total number of congressional seats plus the two senate seats. So California, I think, is fifty six votes. Something has got fifty four. So if we were to make, for example, the House of Representatives bigger, and if we were to say instead of four hundred thirty five in the House of Representatives, we went to six thirty five. We would write the balance. We would, just by doing that, we would shrink the power of some of the um, uh, less populated states. And remember, the, the real evil of the Electoral College is, is it's, it's bad that it favors the underpopulated states, but the real evil is the way it tends to make, um, to nullify the votes of people who live in states that are politically one-sided. Yeah, so a state yeah, yeah, like yeah. California, which now votes two to one, Democratic, but uh, neither Republicans nor Democrats put much effort into California because why should they? Because yeah. the outcome is preordained. Whereas they put a lot of outcome effort into Florida, which is a big state, but which is a closely divided one. Um, so we need to think about about how we make you know our elections more contested. But uh, but the reforms I am most immediately interested in um, are making the District of Columbia state uh, to. Make uh, to bring a more urban uh, quality into the into the Senate. Um, you'd probably get two senators of color, bang, right away from that. Um, and uh, to make the Senate work more effectively, but expanding the House could go far to weakening the the ill effects of the uh, electoral college. But also, you're right to adopt a modern voting rights act. Yes. Well, um, so we the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
which is still in effect, um, but its, its most important provision was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2013. And, and what the Supreme Court did, it, it, what they said in 2013 was not crazy, by the way. The Supreme Court said, uh, the Voting Act, Rights Act said, those states and cities that have histories, that have pre-1965 histories of racial discrimination, they get special scrutiny from the Department of Justice. What that meant in 2013 was that the state of Hawaii, which had a history of uh, racial pr uh, privilege in voting, that got special scrutiny. And the state of Wisconsin, which is the worst actor north of the Mason-Dixon line, it didn't get special scrutiny. Yeah. And the Supreme Court said that's irrational. And the Supreme Court, I think, was right about that. So I think a modern Voting Rights Act has to begin by saying the problem with the measures that were struck down in 2013 was they gave special scrutiny according to your behavior in the, half, in the years before 1965. So a modern Voting Rights Act is one that says we need to look, at, um, we are going to need to look at, um, have some system of review that is not based on history, but is based on current practice. Yeah. To say, are there, um, you know, uh, are you gerrymandering? Are, uh, do you consistently make it more difficult to have voting right, voting in poorer neighborhoods and minority neighborhoods than a majority? There's, you need some kind of objective tests based in the here and now that would trigger action by the Department of Justice, not the history lesson that was struck down in 2013. Yeah, yeah. Because actually that's another theme I'd like to address maybe because you're you're talking, if I listen to you, you say it's, it's no use to speculate about the future. I don't do predictions. We should be careful with looking back and saying this is where it all started since had this uniqueness of America where we see, we're seeing global friend, trends. So we need to look at right now. And one of the things, if you talk about the institution, is journalism, right? And actually today, uh, Ilko Bos van Rosenthal, who's a friend of the John Adams Institute, journalist, he wrote a piece about how American journalism is, well, in, 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 in trouble since they don't know how to deal with this president. And one of the things that some people said was you should stop covering America as a democracy. Because if you do that, um, you do the wrong things. You cover every press conference, you, you cover everything the president says, because in general essence you think governments are in good faith. What you should do is, you should cater everything as a sandwich, say the disclaimer, he's probably not true, Trump said this, and doctors uh, r disputed that. How do you see this role of journalism? Because, yeah. because it was quite a telling piece, I think, how this discussion is going on in America. Um. We have no BBC, um, and even our most powerful elite institutions, like the New York Times, have very limited range, very limited reach compared to their counterparts in Europe. Uh, the beginning of wisdom about jur journalism in the United States is to understand that the most important media companies in the United States are not the New York Times, not CNN, not even Fox News. The most important media company in the United States, by far, is Facebook. And the next most important media company in the United States is YouTube. Yeah, and yeah. probably Reddit is somewhere up there. And uh, a podcaster named Joe Rogan is more important than CNN. Um, and just so when we talk about being in the now, we need to, and so much of our media criticism is based on the media habits of older, better educated, more affluent people who grew up in a different media culture than the one of today. So I, I don't think the problem is that um, cable, I mean, I, there's much to criticize in the way cable news covers anything. Um, and uh, CNN in particular, you know, we all consume it and it has the problem. CNN both try, is both simultaneously trying to be moderate but, yeah. uh, in its positioning, but super sensationalist. In its method, actually, it is of, of the networks. It is by far the, it is more sensational than Fox News. Um, you will find like more uh, because CNN depends so much on keeping you watching for two more minutes. And um, Fox doesn't. Fox I News, mean, yeah. not not as much because Fo Fox is. This is maybe more, but Fox tends to be in. Um, if you get the cheapest cable package, yeah, yeah you yeah. get CNN. Uh, you have to pay a little bit more to get the package that has Fox, typically, not in every town, but in, we do yeah, this by yeah. different regions, yeah. but typically, uh, Fox, so Fox, if, you, if your cable company buys Fox and you take the second package, 
whether you ever watch Fox or not, they get $2 a year from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't really need to keep you watching. They worry about their regular watchers and selling advertising. But CNN is in a different business. So they and they depend enormously on their airport travel. They just need to get eyeballs. And so they tend to be the most. And if you watch them, you will see that they're always saying, you know, uh, coming up, uh, the boy trapped in the well. We will have the story about the boy trapped in the well at the 55 minute mark. But they don't tell you it's going like just in a, this desperate effort to keep you moving. But for all of that, it's not as important at all as the way that um, Facebook manipulates those who are less sophisticated. I mean, the fact is that people who are watching cable news are by far the best informed people, by far the most politically mobilized, yeah, yeah. Uh, most attached to the political system. They, they, if they are absorbing, if the, their cable news package is biased, it's because the, the, uh, the consumer wants that bias, understands the bias, is paying money for the bias or giving time. Facebook is engaged in a much more, uh, is dealing with yeah. much, people are much more disconnected and their disinformation. And it's not just political, by the way, um, you know, that the Facebook, if you, if you were to say, what is the single most important consequence of the existence of Facebook? It's the return of measles and other preventable diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, because in, in 1995, if you were an anti-vaxxer, you didn't know anyone who didn't think you were crazy. Uh, yeah. Whereas in 2020, if you're an anti-vaxxer, you can build a community of people who think you're not crazy. But actually, that's also something you write about in your book, because you get this sort of new, strange, interesting coalitions that sort of break through the, well, the, the boundaries we used to set for ourselves from Democrats, Republicans, left, right. It's a whole different kind of um, uh, right. forces that erupt there, right? Well, you see this in, in the reaction to the pandemic. Um, and I have this question in the book is, um, you know, we, we have the people who are opposed to modern medicine, who doubt science on, um, yeah. uh, on the pandemic, are they left wing or right wing? I, I, Assume and it's true in the Netherlands is here that when you if you were when you meet these people they have this many of them have patterns that look right or backgrounds that look right wing others have backgrounds that look left wing, but in this new world what they agree about is that the, the pandemic is a fake that Bill Gates wants to put a microchip in your body, um, and yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. the same way I mean the, we we have we've had a revival of conspiratorial anti-Semitism um, is that left wing or is that right wing mm -hmm. uh, it it appeals to people on on both sides. And meanwhile, in the era of Trump and Brexit, you, you discover like, John Major and Tony Blair, what do they disagree about? I mean, they, it, once upon a time, they're the deepest political enemies. And today, probably on the most important issues facing Great Britain, John Major and Tony Blair probably mm. agree about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our way of analysis has also to change, maybe. Yeah. There are different questions, I guess. Again. There are indeed. Uh, a number of people are wondering, uh, we saw again today that Trump refuses to say whether he'll accept the outcome of the elections. Um, yeah. uh, Roger Stone has said, you should declare martial law right away. Right. What would, could possibly happen if he does indeed not accept the outcome? Constitutional limbo, martial law, what are the, uh, the scenarios? Yeah. Well, with Donald Trump, um, there's always the combination of his political pathology and his psychological pathology. Um, so what you're hearing when he talks about not accept, it's also, he can't he cannot psychically cope with not being the dominant, all-powerful winner. So he doesn't have a plan B. Um, you know, uh, President Obama, going into the 2012 election, um, had ordered um, a part of his administration to focus on a trans, should he lose, a transition plan to Mitt Romney. Um, and that there are people, there was a group of people whose job it was to prepare for the, the possibility that President Obama would lose and would have to transition power. Um, because the way a psychologically normal politician thinks is, I hope I win, I believe I deserve to win, I think I probably will win, but nothing in life is certain and you have to be prepared for every eventuality and I don't want to look, and if I lose, I don't want to look irresponsible and selfish and like I didn't, I only cared about me and not the country. So Donald Trump doesn't have that. But he's also trying, he depends on emotion this dark emotional energy. So he's trying to stoke it because um, he knows that his people are intimidating, that they are the people who go to polling stations with guns and stand, and we saw some of this in 2016, and we'll see more of it in 2020, stand with guns and try to frighten away women who are coming with children and maybe 
deter them from voting or create a general mood of uncertainty and chaos that will allow Donald Trump to hold on to power in, in some way. I don't know. I don't think he's got a plan. He never has plans, but he's got habits and, and impulses. Um, and if the vote is close, I think we could be into some very dangerous situations. Uh, we could also see um, a part of the country decide that even if Biden wins and takes the oath and assumes power, that somehow that they are no longer connected. The, system, the whole system is no longer legitimate. And so, you, you know, we we had this, you know, in in the uh, 15 years after the Civil War. You know, the people in the Western movies, the Jesse James and Billy mm -hmm. the Kid and people like that, they were veterans of the Confederate Army. Yeah. who would go far, who had decided the government had no standing in their eyes. And so they moved out beyond the reach of, of society, and they then attacked train. They were both political terrorists and bandits. And that's a common pattern, right? That you, you rob the train to disrupt the U.S. mail because you hate the United States, and you also yeah, yeah. make a dishonest dollar for yourself at the same time. And, and we may see some of that, and Donald Trump is sort of preparing the way for that. But at the same time, um, if that happens, then you say he might not win the popular vote, but we have the risk, and that was quite an, a harsh sentence, we have a risk of losing the connection of the people who voted for him to the political system in America. Yes. If you say Keeping that, the then it sounds to me, as a total nitwit on the subject, it sounds to me as if that's maybe even a bigger risk or even more worse than him becoming president again. It sounds like a catch-22. No, well, well, look, we have to solve one, one problem at a time. <laughs> okay. And it's, it's like that game Jenga where you have to take away yeah. the sticks. <laughs> yeah. Or like uh, in the James I always Bond lose movie. With, yeah. Me too. Or, with, or okay, in the James Bond movie where they have to cut one wire after another to defuse the yeah. bomb. Uh, you can't cut all the wires at once. It's one at a time. And then the expertise is knowing which wire is the one to cut last. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But so you, so, and so bringing about a more normal political, a more normal government, that's task one. Uh, but then we have to find some way. I mean, 63 million people voted for Donald Trump. And m they're not moving anywhere. Uh, and, and while they are getting older, they are going to be with us for some time. And we have to find some way to reconcile as many of them as possible. What would be the first uh, step? To, well, I, um, that's the last third of the book. I think we need to, first, the, uh, the first step is to make sure, or no, the most important step is to make sure the government works better for people. I mean, one of the reasons that Americans are so alienated uh, from government is they don't see results for them. Um, so I talk in the book about a couple of, uh, a series of projects that I think could bind the citizens closer to the government. And some come from what we would conventionally call the left-hand side, and some come from what we call, call the right-hand side. So I'm very impressed I, uh, by the way that people in other countries feel bound to their state by their health insurance system. That, you know, that, that what does it mean to be British? What does it mean to be Canadian? That the health insurance system is an important part of that self-definition. Mm -hmm. No American would talk that way. But people, you know, the famous line of John F. Kennedy, ask what you can do for your country. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do a little bit of asking now of what the country can do for people. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so if, if people felt, well, what does it mean to be an American? Well, among other things, it means I get this card. That means if I get sick, somebody takes care of me. That's what it means to be British. That's what it means to be Canadian. I think that's what it means to be Dutch. And, and it should part be part what it is, means to be American. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, get a, I get some concrete material benefits that other people don't get, not because I'm better and they're worse. Like, uh, no, I don't think Dutch people think they're better because only Dutch people get the benefits mm -hmm. of the Dutch health system and Belgians don't. Mm -hmm. um, it just means that's what it means to belong yeah. to this political community. Yeah. But at the same time, I think we have to reinforce our political community by having less mass migration. And that those two things, that the, um, the health provision, more health provision and less immigration go together. But we have to look at a series of things to bind the people more closely to the state um, mm -hmm. and to give them a feeling of ownership and responsibility and protectiveness and to see the state as something that works for them, not against them. Tracy. Uh, looking forward to uh, a possible uh, outcome of the election where Biden is chosen, uh, one of our audience members says he has quite a diverse base, going from Bernie Bros to the Lincoln Project. Can this coalition hold together if he is indeed elected? 
Um, the, in the, if it doesn't, that's partly good news. That is, if we have a rapid return to a more normal Republican Party, uh, then a lot of Repub I mean, I, the Lincoln Project, I think, when you talk about that, I don't know if that name means anything to a Dutch audience, but the Lincoln Project is a group of disaffected Republicans yeah, who yeah. created some very clever ads. But the secret, one of the important parts of Biden's success is that he's not just winning these few Republican activists, but that millions of Republican leaners in suburbs voted Democrat in 2018 and yeah. will vote for him in 2020. Those people may drift away. That wouldn't be a bad thing. It would mean that we're having more normal two-party competition mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Maybe if, we, if, if we're going to round it off a little bit, maybe there are some questions. We can look at one ad from the Lincoln Project, because if we're talking about things that are happening right now in the coming weeks, the videos by the Lincoln Project are quite, a, it's the third video, uh, Victor, are quite, um, well, they come from the Never Trump uh, campaign in the Republican Party, right? They come from many Republicans. And actually, they sometimes are better at showing um, <laughs> a big stance than some Democratic videos, I would say. <laughs> um, can we see it, Victor? Losers. <coughs> Suckers. <laughs> Dopes. Babies. That's how Donald Trump describes our men and women in uniform. Even Fox News confirms he said it. An American president would know our troops are defined by words like courage, honor, integrity, strength, patriotism, valor, and for so many, sacrifice. He's a draft dodger in chief who despises the men and women he supposedly leads. He insults their deaths and injuries with his contempt. He looks down on them for serving this nation, mocking them because there's no money in it. Millions of Americans have served and sacrificed. Millions more have sent a family member off to war. Only Donald Trump mocks their deaths because Donald Trump is simply un-American. Is responsible yeah. for the content of this advertising. I, th I think you can say it's quite a harsh commercial, and it does something that um, maybe to to see what choices can we make in the coming weeks, what's going on. It's like trying to pay him back on his own ground on, on by saying he he's talking about make America great again, about patriotism, and the way to confront him is by showing that he's un-American. What do you think of that? Because you search for a way to get the country back together, to get communities connected to each other, and at the same time, the responses to Trump, well, you can say it's also polarizing in a sense. Yeah. Well, for the first two years of the Trump presidency, um, you would often hear um, pro-Trump defenders say, never Trump is not a political party, it's a dinner party. Mm. <laughs> it was a mean joke. And then in 2018, the Democrats took the House of Representatives. And the way they took it was not by, it was not because of Alexand the famous Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Her seat was Democratic before. Uh, this, uh, it was not Ilan Omar. Her, her seat was Democratic before. The seats that were not Democratic before were seats like um, the 7th District of Texas. Now, this is a, a seat that George H.W. Bush, the elder Bush, won in 1966. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. stayed Republican through Watergate, through uh, the Iraq War, through the financial crisis, and it went Democratic in 2018. Newt Gingrich's former seat in suburban Atlanta, it went Democratic in 2018. And you go through air, seat after seat in wealthy or affluent suburbs but, uh, that normally are Republican, and they went Democratic, with, by the way, the winners often being, or almost always being women. Um, and that's that's Donald Trump's risk, is that he has, he, when you look at the groups he's losing, uh, the most dangerous group to him is he's been losing Republican-leaning, college-educated women. Um, and they, uh, they are the people who threaten his hold on Florida. They are the people who uh, threaten his hold um, on Arizona. Uh, and so the Lincoln Project, I think if you, 
to, to formulate it as this group of consultants is, is to see something wrong, is to understand that what is happening here is that, that millions of normal of people who voted for Mitt Romney in 2012 and voted for John McCain in two, or George Bush in 2004 yeah, yeah. are moving away from Donald Trump. Yeah. Maybe a last question to top it off, because your profession used to be speechwriter, right? Yeah. Um, if the elections have been, and, and Joe Biden, as right now we're not going to speculate, but if we just freeze the moment and, and take it 40 days ahead, he's going to win. What would be your biggest advice for him in his speech? I'm not talking about ideas, but what should be in that speech? It, it, I mean, when he, when his acceptance speech? Yes. Um, I think he has to... This is something I keep saying. <laughs> um, that and I, and I guess I it feels odd to write for a democratic president, but <laughs> no, no. I mean, I say, 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 maybe to say this to a group in the Netherlands and to our friends around the world is, is, is this is a good moment to say that that we want to encourage people to believe that the America that they trusted that, to keep the peace to protect that America it was always there, and and it got a little it got covered by dust and filth over the past few years, but underneath it's there. And we're going to blow off the dust, polish uh, the brass, and make it gleam again. And that the country you believed in, it's it's waiting for you. And so I think that he can talk about that in a way that will touch so many different kinds of people, that, you, that the, you, the faith in the country that you may have lost, he's going to try to restore it. I think that's an excellent note to end this conversation mm -hmm. on. I want to thank you so much, uh, David Frum, and I'd like to give the final word to uh, Tracy Metz of the John Adams Institute. Thank you. Also, uh, uh, on behalf of the John Adams, thank you so much for joining us, David Frum, with your insights and your, uh, your uh, very sharp mind and your view of history. I think that has really added a lot this evening. I wanted to mention to our readers uh, some of our upcoming events. On October 6th, we'll be having a conversation with last year's Nobel Prize winner for economics, Banerjee, Abhijit Banerjee, about his research into solutions for poverty. October 20th, Susan Neiman, who's an American philosopher living in Berlin, about her book, Learning from the Germans, about how the US can learn from how the Germans dealt with their past in uh, post-war years. And on November 4th, the day after the elections, we'll be having an event that we're calling The Day After, at which a number of speakers who've been at the John Adams previously will share in, in short blocks of 15 to 20 minutes their impressions of what happened the day before. Thank you for joining us. Sign up for our newsletter to keep abreast of what we're doing. Um, these are exciting times, and there are a lot of exciting things going on at the John Adams Institute and at the Bali. Thank you, Tim, for this wonderful collaboration. You're very welcome. Thanks so much for watching. Watch the side of the Bali for our next programs. And uh, lastly, again, uh, I'd like to thank David Froome for talking to us. Thank you so much. Thank you.